Okay, I hope I've whetted your appetite enough that you want to see the um, explicit definition of what these tree ordinal gadgets is. It's it's really quite elegant. Um, it's it's rather formal, um, but I think we have the intuition for it. Hopefully, um, it may seem rather circular, but it could, because it's a very inductive definition. Um, so here's the deal: um, we define each of the tree ordinal classes, omega n, uh, where n is some natural number. Um, Alpha is in omega n if there's one of three things we can say about it. First of all, it could be just the number zero, okay? Or it could be the successor of some alpha prime that's already known to be in omega n. So it's closed under successorship. Each tree ordinal class is tr closed under successorship. The, the interesting one is that um, alpha could be a function from omega k to omega n for some natural number n with k less than n, strictly less than n. Okay, so let's work through what that means explicitly, um, starting with them n equals 0, n equals 1, n equals 2. Okay, so when n equals 0, the last condition is completely vacuous. That's not possible. Um, and so all we get is that 0 is one of these omega 0 gadgets and that it's closed under taking successors. Okay, and that just means it's the natural numbers. It's zero in all its iterated, iterated successors. Okay, so that's not too surprising. Why well, I've already told you that omega zero should end up being natural numbers. Okay, now, okay, omega one, that's going to include omega zero because it still has the same starting ingredient and it's still closed under successors. But now it's going to have more because now when n equals one, then k equals zero is a possibility in this third thing. Okay, so omega-1 is also closed under the operation of taking functions with domain omega-0, that's just the natural numbers, okay, and whose range is lies in whatever part of omega-1 we've already built out. So we want to think of just kind of progressively building this thing out, um, and any time we have something that we think might be all of omega-1, we ask, okay, can we create anything new? by either taking another successor or a bunch of successors if necessary, or more interestingly, um, take a sequence of omega ones that are already are known to exist, and then basically define a new gadget to be essentially the limit of that sequence. And the clever thing we're doing is that instead of saying, if I've got a sequence of things in omega one, we create a new object that is intended to be the limit of that sequence, we just actually define the sequence itself to be the new object. So, most important example of that is um, take the identity function on omega zero, omega naught, the natural numbers, as we've seen before, um, just define alpha of k to be k itself. By definition, by this new, the, the precise definition, that's supposed to be an element of omega one. Okay, and this is exactly our new definition of omega naught. So here's here's the here's the change in perspective. We thought of omega naught as some gadget that has as extra data, namely its fundamental sequence, the identity function that says the kth element of the of the fundamental sequence for omega naught, this funky gadget called an ordinal number, is going to equal k itself. So the kth element of the fundamental sequence is k itself. But here's what we do now. We just say, you know what? We don't need to have some extra gadget or some extra placeholder we just say we identify omega naught as the sequence itself, as the function k goes to k. Okay, very standard mathematical trick, um, but something that takes students a while to get used to. I know that from from teaching more basic versions of this. Um, we look at what data is crucial to characterizing an object. In this case, we're just obsessed with fundamental sequences for ordinals, um, and then we just use that data as the definition of the object, and we throw away any extra any extra stuff that really doesn't add to the definition. Okay, so let's look at another example. Suppose we had some, we redefined alpha, and now we say alpha of k is 2 to the k. Hey, that is a function from omega naught. As it happens, it's from omega naught just to omega naught, but that certainly counts as something that whose domain is omega naught and whose range is lies in omega one, because we know omega naught's already legal as part of omega one. Um, that's going to be another element of big omega one. Um, to an ordinary ordinal theorist, they'd say, you know, I'm thinking that's just an increasing sequence of natural numbers. Uh, that feels to me like a, just a different choice of fundamental sequence for good old-fashioned omega. Okay, but 
by our this new definition, we really think of it as a different object. Okay, um, and it's just we just say okay, it's identified by exactly that function. So this is just a very clever way to say what I was saying before, which is we are we are absolutely promoting the fundamental sequences for every single ordinal that we're thinking of to preeminence. Um, and in fact, we're throwing away everything but the fundamental sequences. Okay, let me see. Um, let's let's think about other objects, other elements in big omega one. Okay, we can always use successor. Whenever we have something we've we've just defined, even in this clever way by doing sort of the fundamental sequences, we can always use successor as well. So omega naught plus one is in here, omega naught plus two, etc. We can just throw all of those in. Okay, and then we can define yet a new tree ordinal. Okay, we're going to say let's say alpha of k is omega naught plus k. Okay, so that's really um, exactly just the standard fundamental sequence for what we've for a long, long time now called omega naught plus omega naught, or a slightly weird, a quicker way to say it is omega naught times two doubled. Okay, um, and but we're what we're thinking of here is that it's just exactly identified by that function. At this alpha is something that takes a natural number, something in omega zero and creates a bunch of stuff that is already known to be in omega-1, that creates a new element of omega-1. Boom. Okay, and nothing more is really necessary. Um, suppose we, we could have something where we had omega naught of k is equal to k, the identity function, and then let's say we did omega naught plus 2 to the k. So omega naught was defined by just using the sequence 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, etc. This guy uses the sequence 0, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. Well, those are different. We really wouldn't exactly call that omega naught plus omega naught or omega naught doubled. Okay. An ordinary ordinal theorist would pretty much not notice the difference, but we would have to notice because it's like, hey, for some reason we decided to use different fundamental sequences for these two versions of omega. Um, and that's the kind of distinction that we are, are using here. Okay. Um, so, as I said, this really just accomplishes in an incredibly elegant way, those three lines are really quick, uh, is that for every ordinal we ever use, it automatically comes equipped with a particular choice of fundamental sequence, and if those fundamental sequences mention smaller infinite ordinals, they're really going to actually have intrinsically attached to them their own fundamental sequences, and so on and so on. It does it in a very elegant way by basically saying the fundamental sequence is the ordinal. Okay. Now, if you don't like fundamental sequences, for a lot of purposes of ordinal analysis and arithmetic and all that kind of stuff, the fundamental sequences are extra data, and this is a horrible idea. But for our purposes, we've always thought of the fundamental sequences as, as important because they're necessary to create fast-growing functions and slow-growing functions, etc. Okay. So I do want to note something, that this definition is so general, it's really quite floppy. Um, we didn't put any conditions on this function. I didn't say it was increasing. I didn't say it had some sort of infinite limit, that it was unbounded. It's just a function, period. And it only had, the only thing it had to do uh, is that it went from a smaller ordinal class than the one we're talking about right now to the ordinal class that we're trying to create. Um, and that's it. And for some purposes, that floppiness is, is totally appropriate. We're going to cut it down real quick. Um, so this definition is a little weird that these don't really seem like fundamental sequences if we, for, for example, have alpha of k is the constant function zero. That doesn't look like we're trying to really create some new big ordinal using a fundamental sequence. Or like one plus minus one to the k, which goes like one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. It's not even monotonic. Uh, it's not even increasing or decreasing. So those are legal definitions of things in omega one. But for us, they're gonna be pretty, um, perverse elements of omega-1, okay? We're really not going to use those, but it's interesting that for a lot of the fundamental definitions that um, Wainer does in his article, you, you don't even notice. It, it just it carries through for even for somewhat bizarre pathological things like this, like that, okay? But uh, I think for our purposes, we just don't even need to worry about them because we're never going to take advantage of that that flexibility. Okay, so let's keep going. I, I think just getting to omega-1 doesn't quite really cut it. Now let's try to think about what omega-2 looks like in this more careful way, okay? So automatically, just from the definition, we don't have to throw them in by hand, it includes omega-0 and omega-1, okay? Because um, it's already, it has zero, it's closed undertaking successors, and it's certainly 
we're allowed to take functions with domain omega zero, because zero is less than two, but it's also closed under the more powerful operation of taking functions with domain omega one. And of course, range inside whatever of omega two we've already so far created, which could be just omega zero or omega one until we create more and more and more of it. Okay, so um, as usual, the, the, mo the interesting one to start with is what we call little omega one, which is the identity function on big omega one. Okay, this is just a, this is just something where you put in a gamma thought of as th the index for a fundamental sequence. I'm saying what's the gamma th element of the fundamental sequence for this new gadget? Guess what? It's just gamma itself. Okay, and so what this says basically is we're trying to define little omega one. It's really uh, our version of the least uncountable ordinal. Um, we just we, we sort of put all all the ordinals we have so far, which basic which is big omega one, which is essentially all the countable ordinals. We just put those all in order, and then we say, well, what's what's the next thing beyond that? What's a really good way to sneak up on the next thing that we haven't put in our big bag yet in big omega one? Just stare at what you got. Just look at all the things you have on the table in order, and um, define that ordering to be the next thing. Um, it's, 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 again, it's one of these great mathematical tricks that can be really bewildering because there's, it's saying, it's making something have content that's almost tautological, okay? So um, we're, we're sort of generalizing the idea of fundamental sequence. We're gonna say, let's look at all the elements leading up to omega one, and that's our definition of omega one, little omega one, this new element. Okay, we could also do something like, hey, let's say, let's take some particular omega one gadgets, a, a gamma in big omega one, uh, countable tree ordinal, and let's just say uh, alpha evaluated at that guy, is that guy doubled? Okay, that's another distinct way to create some new thing that is that was not in big omega one at all. It's really quite something substantially bigger. Um, but it isn't really any bigger than um, than the little omega one by the standards of an ordinary ordinal theorist. It's ju they would just say, oh, you just used a somewhat different fundamental sequence for that. You skipped all the all the countable ordinals that weren't doubles of something. But for us, that is going to be a difference. Okay. Um, all right. So so this so so far notice what we've done is to create something new in big omega 2 we only used we used a function with domain omega 1 and range big omega 1 but of course it's much more powerful once we've created any new ordinals in big omega 2 that weren't already in omega 1 something that's really genuinely new we can use those as the argument, as the um, the values of fundamental sequences, okay? Um, I don't think I'm going to take the time to talk about exact the exact precise definition of addition, multiplication, exponentiation. It'll come up a little bit in, in future videos. Um, but it's it's almost exactly the same definition as you'll see for ordinary ordinals. And we can create tree ordinals that are this kind of thing, like little omega one raised to itself, plus little omega one times seven, plus little omega zero, plus three. Those guys will all make perfect sense. This guy would live, for example, in, this would be perfectly happily live in, in big omega two. It doesn't need to live in anything higher, okay? And then of course we go on. We continue to omega three, that's going to contain little what something called little omega two, which is basically line up all these om big omega two gadgets in order, and just define the next thing after that. The next new thing is that whole list. Um, and again, another way to think about it is you're you're thinking that there is some new gadget you've created whose fundamental sequence is that whole list. But the cool, elegant thing is the list itself works as the definition of the new object. Okay, um, how do I say it here? Take all the ordinals with cardinality less than or equal to uh, that of little omega one. Um, and so these are the ones that are sort of the minimally uncountable ordinals. Put in order to lead up to omega two, 
and that's going to be our definition of the least ordinal with the next bigger cardinality. Okay. Um, not technically speaking, you really don't actually have to use the word cardinality. It's 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 lying underneath this stuff. Um, but you can also just say omega three. It's the stuff you can define by doing induction over omega two. That was the stuff you can divide, define by doing omega, induction over big omega one. And that was the stuff you can define by doing induction over big omega zero, ordinary induction. And when I say define by doing induction, it really means any time you need to prove pretty much any statement about an object in, say, big omega three or a function on big omega three, you're going to be doing an induction argument um, that re that relies on induction over this rather large ordered set big omega two, and that's going to descend sort of to okay, did you know how to do induction over this fairly large ordered set big omega one, the set of all countable ordinals basically? Okay, and that was based on doing arguments that were based on induction over the ordinary natural numbers. That's good old-fashioned ordinary induction, the basis of, um, you'd say, Peano arithmetic, for example. Okay, so this gives us a hint as to what's the relation of this to, like, real mathematics, um, uh, proof theory, uh, fundamentals, uh, fundamentals of mathematics, foundations of mathematics. The full definition of this whole hierarchy is what's known as an iterated inductive definition. And you might, if you browse the Wikipedia articles, for example, on this stuff, you've maybe seen very glancing references to that, um, that we are using a logical technique, iterated inductive definition, which starts with natural numbers, uses induction over that, the ordinary kind of induction, to create something, and then you, to create some bigger object, big omega one in particular, and then you induct over that, and then you induct over what you created there, and you induct, induct, induct as many times as you feel like you need to, okay? Um, so it's it's a logical technique, goes well beyond ordinary induction over the natural numbers. Um, it's totally legal, for example, if you have the full power of full set theory, um, like the zermelo frankel set theory that most people use as a foundation of mathematics. It's it's totally legal in that setting. Um, the The foundations of math and proof theory people Though they they say, well, what if you didn't have the full power of set theory? They recognize that this is kind of an intermediate step. Having the ability to do iterated inductive definitions gives you a lot of power that just ordinary induction does not. Okay, so there's some nice relationships to the foundations of mathematics as usual. Okay, one more thing. This is a long video, sorry. Uh, why are they called tree ordinals? What is this word tree coming in here? Okay, you might be familiar with the idea of a tree as a certain kind of mathematical graph from like graph theory. Um, very, very closely related is the idea of a tree comes up in set theory. And honestly, I don't have the good enough references to really explain the story about why these are called tree ordinals. I have the vaguest idea of what how it relates to those kinds of trees. Um, but we're not going to need it, and I haven't looked it up enough to say anything, so I won't.